our academy parents. So this is where we have our classes. All of our classes are going to be held on this floor this summer, which is wonderful. Um, we have summer programs here. We have during the school year, after space, and sometimes during the day, the homeschool families as well. So we use the space quite a bit in that. Um, during time. Our age group really runs from ages five to six all the way up through 15. We also have a program now that is called Labs, and that's a program for that middle group and high school group of kids. And those are on Saturdays. So, no, it's not working, but I'm recording it from the computer and then we can just post it later. Great. Do you want to know about Labs? Yes. So, <laughs> our Learning Among Brilliant Scientists program is for students in seventh through twelfth grade. Um, we essentially um, invite facilitators who are principal investigators, research scientists, to share their research work with the students, and then they also conduct an activity related to that research. Um, and that happens once a month, and the one for tomorrow is actually on Saturday. Oh, Saturday. Today's Thursday. Yeah, I know. It's not Saturday. <laughs> um, it's on puzzles and advanced mathematics, and he is a professor in the Department of Math at Cal. Uh, Cal State LA. Um, and then our next ones are going to be facilitated by Caltech uh, postdocs. One is on astronomy and another one is on x ray crystal crystallography. Um, okay, so we're going to get started. We're not able to live stream, so isn't this a treat that you are here in person? Um, so, just to give you a little bit of background about IEA, um, just to show hand of hands again, who is new to our community in this room? Okay, so almost half. Um, so IEA has been around for 20 years. We have been serving the gifted community and really at the heart of our mission is our um, commitment to serving the holistic development of gifted children. And we do that through providing um, experiences that allow them to gain mentorship um, experiences, um, allow them to um, participate in programs that are an optimal match to where they currently are as a student and, and as an individual, um, and also give them opportunities to explore their interests, their ideas, and their passions. And we did that through some of the programs that Betsy mentioned. So we do serve students in K through 12, um, and we continue to keep in touch with alumni and really try to provide them with services even well beyond their participation in the program. Um, if this is your first time attending a gifted support group meeting, we specifically develop these meetings for parents and educators of gifted children to really um, have an open and safe forum for them to share the challenges and experiences and joys that they have working with or raising a gifted child. And it's also an opportunity for you to hear from experts in the field who really want to share their knowledge and some strategies that can help you um, with your children. So without further ado, Betsy also already introduced herself, but she is the president and co-founder of IEA. So and this is Nina. <laughs> She's um, our program manager here and she many of the programs that we mentioned she helped develop and runs. So um, well this morning we're gonna this morning in that week. We're going to talk a little bit about gifted children in general and then be very specific about some kinds of things that we can do to help those children, not only through their intellect, but through all aspects of self, mind, body, spirit, social, emotional needs. Because when we started this organization, we really understood that gifted young people are gifted 24-7. We might have programs for them that are just for a week here or there. But as parents, you know, these kids have issues, wonderful, quirky, really issues, but 24 seven a day. So we knew that we had to do something to ensure that they had things to engage them and excite them and help calm their minds and all those different things that it takes to, to run um, or have a life where they get to child. We also know that in our country, we're not doing a wonderful job of serving this population. And we'll talk a lot about that tonight, but the reality is so many of our young people go to school every day and don't have the opportunity to learn something new. And they don't have that aha moment of, wow, that was great. 
So we are committed to the fact that we really want to ensure that every child has access to that kind of an education, whether it's in a supplemental program, in their school site, something online, but providing access to rich content. So how do we fuel these young people? How do we develop real resilience? And what are the strategies to do that? When you send your kids off to school, you see them as your children. And maybe that morning you see them as the child who didn't eat their breakfast or that didn't make their bed or however you happen to see that child. You see that child the way you see that child in the morning. So what do you see here? I remember this from school. <laughs> you learned something that day, didn't you? <laughs> It could, it, yeah, there's so many different things. It's the same picture, but we see different things. And then once one person mentions something, you might see what they see, and then you can see all of it. But when you send your child off to school, you may be seeing a rabbit that day, and when they get there, what's the teacher seeing? A duck, or a rocket, or something else. But it's the same thing, but it's communicating what you see and making sure that you're talking about the same thing which is your child. And your child has so many gifted kids, have a multiple stations that they deal with. So you could be hundreds of different things in this picture, all the same thing. Can you read that? Today for show and tell, I bought a tiny marvel of nature, a single snowflake. I think we might all learn a lesson from how this utterly unique, exquisite crystal turns into an ordinary, boring molecule of water. Just like every other one when you bring it into the classroom. And now, while the analogy sinks in, I'll be leaving and going outside. So, our kids don't feel seen necessarily for who they are, or they feel drained sometimes when they get into that classroom. Regardless of how you feel about the bell curve, we're going to use this as it's a good way just to make an understanding of what we're talking about here. So my background's in special education. So my master's is in that. That's why I started my career. And most of the young people that I dealt with were all in this two standard deviations away from the norm, one or two. And trust me, all those kids needed the help that they got. And it was a wonderful, beautiful thing that, that we did to work with those young people. One day when I was working in my special day class, there was a child who came without his medication. Normally he slept through the morning, but he didn't that day. And he was the most brilliant young person I ever seen. And I was stunned. They didn't teach me that in college. I had no idea what to do with this enemy, but I knew we were going to have a good day, and we did. Now I was young, probably not very smart. I happened to put this medication in my pocket and say, you know what we're going to do tomorrow is you don't take the medication in the morning. I didn't give it to you at 10, but we're going to have two hours of stuff. And then you take your medication at 10. Well, it taught me that he was probably not the only child who had been misdiagnosed and placed in a special day classroom because of issues and just medicated because his mind worked too fast. So that's when I decided to go into the field and look at what happened on the other side of the spectrum. So a child who is two standard deviation below the norm has issues. But if we're looking at gifted kids who are two standard deviations away from the norm, are they going to be different? Yeah. There are not as many of them, but certainly they have their needs. And when you have a child who is highly gifted in this category, and I know many of you have in this room have children that are highly gifted, they're even that much farther away from the norm, and they have that much more. They're in that much more need of special and unique services. Yeah, the unique thing about gifted education is that their services required are not nearly as extensive as a child on the other spectrum. It's just shifting the way you see things a little bit. You want to see a rabbit every now and then. You want to look at how they have special services. But when we talk about gifted, Many people, we think we're just talking about something that's better. But these kids aren't better than other kids. They're just plain different. And we're all different. 
gifted children not only think differently than other children, they feel different. Their physical being is different. That's why we talk about the mind and the body of a gifted child. Their intellectual capacity combined with their emotional intensity provides them with a qualitatively different way of experiencing the world. And this is where we often get into trouble with our kids because we don't understand necessarily why they're feeling something so intensely. To the point they might be shaking or their stomach hurts or they're, they have a headache or they just can't process something or they shut down. Michael Bukowski, who is one of our senior fellows, is also a researcher who's done a great deal of work with Dabrowski, which is a psychologist who work on uh, personality, basically. And we'll talk more about that later on. But he's a, a major expert in the field of gifted education. We're very fortunate to have him as, as our senior fellow. He was actually our first senior fellow. And he comes to camp with us every year. One of the programs that we run is called UNASA. And UNASA is... Um, I think one of our most unique initiatives. It's a summer camp where we take students for a week to the wilderness. We go to Colorado, Michigan, and we talk about all aspects of self and really spend that intense time with these experts where we hold these kids for 24 hours a day and really help them understand who they are. But we're lucky to have him there. But what he says is that what's wonderful about these kids is their emotional sense they need that. They really need that sense of who they are to provide context to what they do. And that's how they create these new ideas and they are able to deal with the world. They need to have this intensity to be able to go to the next level of what they're doing. So, a few characteristics. Um, excellent memory. How many of you have a child who sometimes tells you you're going the wrong direction? Or do not it. literally that, but, but, but it's completely aware of what you should be doing and you're not doing. Yes. So, yes. Oh. And sometimes it would be, it then maybe three years since you drove that way someplace and they right. tell you something else. So, excellent memory. Not just when it comes to academics, but when it comes to anything. And sometimes it's actually very surprising. They're very excited about learning. We know that. That's probably not a surprise to anybody. I'm sure you have kids that are eager to do that. Um, active, but very interested in philosophical and social issues. And this is something that, that really, I think, helps separate these young people from other folks. Not every child feels this, but many do. That they really do have a desire to understand why. Why does the world work this way? What does that mean? And they ask those big questions. One of the things I ask kids that come into my office for, for a meeting or whenever we're interviewing for something or just a casual conversation is, what is the big why question that's keeping you awake right now? You'd be amazed at things like that. But it's remarkable. And it, those things often keep me awake that night too because they're pretty remarkable questions. They really think hard about those things, which is a good thing for all of us. They have um, a great intellectual curiosity and a vivid imagination. Do you all experience that with your children? One thing that we talk about when they start to have that imagination or daydream is to really talk about what is real and what's in their imaginary world. And helping them understand or create that difference of, I think the story you're telling me and what you're saying is really important, but we're gonna talk about, is this a real story or the, or is this something that you are imagining? Both are great. I like the story, but we just need to kind of separate fact from what's going on in your mind. <laughs> they see things a little bit differently, and they have a wonderful sense of humor, which I think is great. Deep sense of humor. So many of these young people get along very well with adults because the adults around them understand their sense of humor and the kids around them don't. So it's another reason why they like talking to adults is because they can have that wit and banter. Um, it's also a little bit challenging because when they have that wit and banter and you're talking to them as if they're their 20-year-old self and they're really just they're being their, 
seven-year-old, when that changes, it's kind of challenging. Um, ability to understand abstract ideas and thoughts. And this is what, again, makes them so interesting and curious of uh, looking at things and pulling them together. There was a young boy in my office this week who is six, and I'm looking to remind myself that he was six. I constantly remind myself that he was six. He was small. He looked like he was six, but he wrote. He had the best penmanship of anybody I've ever met, like a perfect school teacher. He spoke in the best vocabulary of anyone I've met personally. He could do math in his head, and he often would create story problems in his mind when I asked him questions of, you go to a hotel, how great is that? How was your visit? It was wonderful. You know, we stayed on, on the 64th floor in that hotel, but you know what that means when they have to create that? And where would you have to be? You couldn't do that in this place because of this. I mean, he was amazing, but able to do this complex problem solving. But also this depth, intensity, and empathy. How many of your kids are able to really feel what you're feeling? Or another child? Do you want to share an example? I think my son's just very intuitive when I'm upset about something or if I'm sad about something. He will come over and just sit next to me, give me a hug, or say, you know, what's wrong? And even though sometimes it's not always appropriate for me to really share. He just, there's just this deep sense of empathy. And when he sees things, like you were saying, the, the social justice issues, it really bothers him to see homeless people. And he will ask a million questions. And he just started his own little business where he bakes and he wants to sell it or he wants to donate it. And I said, well, you know, what are the ways you can sort of advertise your business is to donate it for certain things. So we had our annual church fiesta. He wanted to donate to that. But the first question he asked me was, Mom, is it going to help the homeless? Because he knew that the, the what he was making was going to be sold by the church to raise funds, but he wanted to make sure that it went specifically or at least in part to something like that. And I just thought, wow, at eight years old, I don't think I thought about anything like that. I don't think I care about anybody. You're eight. The world revolves around you. And just a really deep sense of empathy and concern that I, I didn't expect from a young child. So, we said a lot right here. Does else have an example they want to share about that? There's a young person. When my kid was two, because he's five now, um, so when he was two and a half, uh, he was at the park and there was a dog that, you know, the owners had to amputate its leg at some point, so it ran through the legs. And, you know, 30 minutes later, we get home and he, you can tell he keeps thinking, right? he came outside and, you know, you could see the real screen in his head. And then he sees that there's a bush outside her house and he's touching the leaf and he goes, you know, I think I should, maybe we should take this leaf and give it to the dog. I said, why? He said, I think it would make it feel better. And then I realized he was um, remembering the hungry caterpillar who on Sunday ate a large green leaf and felt much better. So that's great. It's a great outlook of everything, of the, the memory and the problem solving and, and bringing it together. At camp, I had one little girl, we had a, a donor that was coming to visit camp, and so we shared with the campers, we have a visitor today, just so you are aware, somebody's coming in. And I was thoroughly nervous. I didn't think I expressed being nervous. I thought it was great. I thought I was fine. But I go out to the lake to take a deep breath, like we teach the kids to breathe, and I'm out there breathing, and then she comes and she tugs at my shirt and she said, don't worry about this, Betsy, you got it. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and then she walked away. <laughs> so just this understanding that things are going on around them and discomforting them on with your son. Amazing. 
We're going to talk more about this sense of justice, but that's another thing these kids think about all the time of why. Why do we have, or why do we have these issues? The world right now is very complex. It's always complex, but right now there's some big questions and big issues. And I see a lot more young people in my office right now than I have seen in a long time because their sense of justice is really compromised and not understanding how or why some people treat others a certain way or it's not logical, it, just, it doesn't make sense. Um, and I told the story, some of you have heard this before, but one of the most profound examples of this was a young person who I worked with and I got a call from the school to come down and I couldn't figure out why the school was calling me. I mean, the parents were there and okay, fine, I'm happy to come down. But he had found himself under the desk, he was um, seven, under the desk, then he, he wouldn't come out. His parents couldn't get him out, but they had taken all the kids out of the classroom and they were out in the playground. So I went down on the desk with them and I said, okay, so we talked about stuff and together, what, can you share with me? Can we try to put words to what you're feeling? And it turns out what happened was on the playground, there were two kids that got in a fight. And one kid got in trouble. But it wasn't the kid that started the fight. And he couldn't understand why this one kid was in so much trouble when he wasn't in, he didn't have anything to do with this problem. And it really upset him and he could not process that information. So we talked about it, came out, talked to his teacher, talked to his parents. Um, and one would think that these sensitive, wonderful people at school would have done the right thing here. And unfortunately they suspended him because he disrupted the class and they had to Stop class for two hours, and he spent the two days for having a sense of justice, his sensitivity towards others. So that was a lot of education they do again. That's cool. They're, they don't do that anymore. <laughs> but again, it's because we have to continue to try to help see things in a different perspective. We sometimes are so focused on one way of doing things that always seems to work that looking the other way makes a huge difference. If that school principal had looked slightly the other way to say this could have been an opportunity for the class or for the school to learn something about how do we communicate? How do we feel things? How do you talk to an adult about something that's concerning you? Or any of those issues could have been a great teaching moment if we just looked it's a different way, a slightly different perspective. But then you have people who are able to do that all the time. Building resilience, looking at a situation and making the best of it, how you can. What does that look like for you? Many of our kids are good at that because they have built up that resilience. They've figured out coping skills. And that's the best gift we can give them on those coping skills. It's the best gift we can give ourselves sometimes because I think sometimes these children can be slightly challenging, is to figure out how to make the best of the situation and see that joy in what we're doing whether it's playing in an umbrella or finding alone time. As an organization, we're very aware of the problems we get with education nationally. One of the reasons why there's a big national concern about gifted education or lack of concern about gifted education is because there are probably 35 different definitions of gifted. School districts can have their own definition. There's a federal definition. And this is our definition. We adopt this one from the Columbus Group. The Columbus Group created this definition probably 20, 25 years ago, before we started IEA. And this asynchronous development piece of what they talk about really is a descriptive way of looking at how these young people are different and describes that. The Columbus Group is made up of a group of experts in the field of gifted education. They had all been coming together for quite some time because they liked each other before conferences and they would meet. And one day they sat down, probably over a little bit of wine, I have to admit, and said, you know what, we need to write a real definition, a good definition that really describes who these kids are. And they wrote it. And they said, well, no one's going to listen to us because, shoot, you know. So they decided to call themselves the Columbus Group which became very famous because of this major group of these 10 folks that had never done anything before, but they produced this definition. So people often talk about the Columbus group, it's really these 
10 people. We're very fortunate because six of them are student fellows. So we kind of went after them right away as soon as we grabbed who they were, and they all are folks that work with us. So this is our definition of what we choose to use. Many organizations use the same definition um, nationally. The, the national definition of gifted talks a lot about performance, demonstration of intellect ability, leadership capacity. A lot of it is dealing with that performance. We happen to believe that a child, even if they don't perform like they're gifted, that they're still gifted. If they're not performing as if they have that potential, that's where you have to find that space and figure out what's going on. So it really does depend on who you're talking to you kind of figure out what vocabulary they're using. Where are they starting from when you're looking at how you want to talk about gifted education in your district or your school? Um, just to understand, so you're saying the federal definition is much more about uh, the academic performance, where the Columbus group and you guys think of it uh, not just academic, but also emotional gifted and various other kinds. Well, it's, it's really it's how you, if you have, I think going back to IQ, even though we don't necessarily use that, but if you have an IQ of 140, you are somebody that has high intellectual potential. That doesn't go away. So I, you're gifted, in my opinion. You may never get an A in school, but that doesn't mean you're not gifted. So what we are trying to say is that you may not demonstrate that, you've got to figure out why you're not demonstrating that. Many folks do believe that it is performance-based. You may have that IQ, but if you're not performing at that level, and it doesn't really matter. So we're, we're kind of in that asynchronous place of if, if we need to figure out why you're not doing that. We're not saying everybody has to be getting A's or being a rocket scientist, but being a successful, happy individual and working towards their potential so they're successful and happy within themselves. The federal government also talks about leadership and arts and other aspects of who you are and being able to do that as well. Are just more descriptive of how that might be seen as being different from the norm. So going to overexcitabilities, and this is what we talked about briefly about Dabrowski. And these are not necessarily characteristics, but kind of things that talk about personality. And in your handout, you do have a mini worksheet on a worksheet fan, but you do have a little worksheet in there. And it has a scale, one, two, five. So as we go through this, kind of think about it, think about your child, and then think about you, or your spouse, or somebody in your family. And how does this relate to who you are as a person? Some of your personality traits, if you will. So psychomotor is the first one we really talk about, which is physical activity and movement. Rapid talk, pacing, hand gesture talk. Like I said, I don't have any of those characteristics. I never use my hands, I never talk that. But that's a characteristic. So some of these kids are always needing to move, be busy, raising their hand, really needing to have that, that intensity. Not because they want people to look at them necessarily. It's not that they feel the need to be the center of attention. It's more because they're excited and kind of need to do that. Think about yourself. Some people pace when they're thinking, talking on the phone, or if you're in a meeting and you doodle to help you think. People use movement to calm down, to help solve a problem. So that, that's kind of where that psychomotor piece comes in. It's also challenging for a teacher if they don't understand it. So helping your child understand and manage that personality trait they have is important. That's where the squishy balls come in or rubbing their, um, inside their pockets, their pants, or, or things to that effect. Uh, stones are often good. I use a lot of thinking putty in my office. I love that. We actually use that at staff meetings too. Thanks. The sensual aspect of who they are, perspective of sensory experiences, Unusual awareness of things around them. The leaf, looking at a beautiful leaf and seeing that it's beautiful. Walking, taking a walk, and all of a sudden stopping to say, Gosh, isn't it amazing when you look at the sun on these leaves? Imagine this, Bryce, 
<laughs> looking outside right now, stopping and just doing something like that is really, they see things in a way that's deep, deeply touching. That sensation is really important to them. So being a part of that part of their life is important. So sharing art with your kids. Museums are important. Many people think that one of the reasons why gifted children like classical music so much is because there's so many notes in there and they can process that and it keeps their mind engaged and it's calming because they're being fed intellectually. Many young people are very sensitive to lights. You hear that often of kids that are on the spectrum, but many gifted kids are very sensitive to that too because they have these sign sensitivities. They hear fluorescent lights, they see the flicker of lights. They walk into a classroom that has too much stimulation, it can be overwhelming. Sound, too loud. Very, very sensitive to those kinds of things. Imaginational. These young people have clear and vivid imaginations. Harry Potter was the best thing that ever happened to give to children <laughs> because they could read something that was in their frame of reference when they were six, seven, eight years old and it fed the imagination and it took them so many places. That is one of the reasons why these kids have a great way of seeing things differently and can solve these complex problems because they look the other way. It's also interesting from a, a recent client when you take it a little bit too far. So the question here was, tell me a place that is a happy place, but then makes you happy. Well, when she said Hawaii, and she drew a picture of Hawaii, well, that's pretty nice. Hawaii is nice, I get that. And she said, oh, but can I, can I add something to that? Because Hawaii is really not my happy place unless my mermaid is there. Oh, okay. So then she drew the mermaid. So her happy place is why with her mermaids. So we talked about mermaids and so on and so forth. And that was, that was great and delightful. And then she said, but really, it's my imagination. It's my happy place. And this is where she lives. This is where she lives most of the day. When she's in school, she lives in her imagination world. When she's talking to her family and they don't understand her, she lives in her imaginary world. So this is her, she's a mermaid. And she really is a mermaid. And her friend. And this is a princess. And of course a unicorn because in a magic world you'd have all those things. What was challenging was she kind of had dissociated. She took it a little too far. So great imagination helped her survive and help her get through those things that she was creating. Her drawings are pretty complex. She's six. But it was helping her find. Was that in response to something that was happening in the real world, as it were? I mean, a negative thing. Well, for her, the reason why she was with me was because she wasn't, couldn't find a place in the school. They were, she wasn't being fed intellectually, but she also wasn't fitting in at home because she had a parent issue where one parent thought she, she was gifted and needed the support, and the other parent thought she should just be a kid and didn't need any services. So there was things that she was dealing with. But it's an example of how in depth their imaginative worlds can really be and the stories that they can tell them. So going back to saying what's really happening, where are you? Your imaginary world is great and we love that, but where are you and how do you fit into that? We often have kids that talk about being too, too intense. People talk about that. I have a client who also lives in, with her two family of stuffed animals. And they are too intense, too much, too much too worse. It's all too intellectual. Need to ask questions. That's clear. I'm sure you have the why, 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 why. <laughs> and then you're thinking, why? <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to solve those problems, figure them out, do those puzzles, keep them engaged. This intellectual piece. Well, we don't talk a lot about it in these kinds of talks, it's because we know that is the first thing you have to deal with is that intellect. And once you start feeding that intellect, the 
Everything else comes in and you can filter through to see what, how to handle or modify. We don't want to change these skills. We want to help them be successful in their world and to round things out a little bit. We're only rounding out a little bit every now and then. So really looking at how to deal with that intellect is, is really critical. Then the emotional sense. Their feelings of are intense. They have intense relationships, sometimes with a pet, sometimes with a sibling, sometimes with one friend. So when that shifts, it's challenging because they don't have a lot of other ways to cope with that. They tend to have this empathy, which other kids don't necessarily understand or why they're concerned about certain things. And sometimes people say something not intending to be at all hurtful, harmful, something you might say to anyone, it is taken very differently and deeply and trying to back away from that. And you don't understand why, because to you, it just doesn't sound like that's not really that big a deal. But to them, it is a big deal. So coming up with words of how to see things in a little bit different way. This is sometimes where the, the stretching a little bit to depression and loneliness and sometimes this is where the problem starts to come in here of not having that vocabulary or understanding of what it looks like it's also a place where they often have attachments to to things to items type teddy bears or blankets or a special place in the house they feel safe and want to be that's okay if that's a safety net and they need that it's okay. They have to take the teddy bear in their backpack to school and leave it there. That's okay. They take the teddy bear to college with them. That's okay too. And if it's sitting on your bed right now at home, that's okay. So, those kinds of things, there are tools. Use them. No problem with that. Because what we know is that we need kids to feel comfortable with who they are. And to understand their differences, and that helps them understand their potential. They are different. They know they're different. They talk about themselves as being different. So helping them understand what that looks like and feels like so they can celebrate the fact that they love to learn. So that personal growth, going back to what does that look like? How do we use things that we know, vocabulary, to understand ourselves? How do we help them find that space for their personal growth? Because that really has to go hand in hand with that intellectual growth to go to the next level. Part of that self-concept comes from being with like-minded peers where they learn to be together. Some of the struggles these young people have is because early on in nursery school even, or kindergarten, if they were even in those classes, they didn't have great peers because their vocabulary was so much bigger than other kids, or their games were so much more elaborate that other kids didn't understand and would kind of walk away because they would get bored. So they didn't have the chance to really create those relationships or go with those tussles that everyone goes through to try to figure out how to share or what that looks like because they didn't really have that peer group. So trying to find a peer group that can help them find their way is really important. Even if that's not an age peer group, it's that intellectual peer group because they'll tell each other what's right and what isn't. They'll figure it out if you listen to a peer of how to do things or how this works for me or what that looks like. So finding those like-minded peers is important. So as we're developing that personal development, the intellectual development is this zone of appropriate challenge, the optimal match. So we know as we're doing this, this works not just with the intellect actually, but with all aspects of growth. You want this gentle tension. You want something to go smoothly across this line where the, it's torque, the tight, it's tight. It's gonna have that tension where it's gonna be movable. What happens if you have something on this and you pull it too hard? So that wasn't good. And if it sags, there's no movement. So this gentle tension, which is sometimes really hard to understand. You want your child to be in that zone where it's a little bit challenging. 
You don't want it to be too saggy because then you don't have movement and they atrophy and their brain atrophies and they just don't know how to move forward. So working with teachers to help them understand you need that zone of appropriate challenge or you looking at that zone of appropriate challenge. Sometimes you're afraid it's going to be too stressful, so you have to be very careful about not too much stress, but right there where it's that thinking zone. While they're thinking, we also know that we have to spend a lot of time thinking about other aspects of what they're learning and not be too focused on that teaching part or the intellectual part. Because these young people have so much potential. All kids do. But these kids have a unique potential that's a little bit different. So we really do have to talk about what that means for their moral and ethical growth. Where is their heart and compassion? They have this empathy, but how do you deal with that? How do you channel it into doing something that's productive and, and, and useful? There's a little, little girl that we worked with who was kicked out of seven preschools. I never thought that could happen, but it really did happen. Parents couldn't find a kindergarten for terribly challenging. Ended up homeschooling. And that still was a challenge for her. She was very physically ill because she felt like she didn't fit in. It was very, it was a tough situation. But we decided to figure out a way for her to use her skill set. She loved horses. So what could she do with horses? Well, she rejected that idea. We thought it was a brilliant idea. But she decided she was going to create a project called the Baby Blanket Project. So here she is five, and she decided that what was the most important thing was what, when babies were born, they probably didn't have books. Now, we know that's probably most, not the most important thing for a baby, but for her, that was the most important thing is a baby's born. Books. So she went around the neighborhood and said, I'm collecting books for the babies that are being born down the street at the hospital. And her neighbors and peers brought her in and talked to her about the book. Well, you know what? I'm happy to give you a book, but why don't I give you a blanket too? Or what else can we use for those kids? So she didn't hear that from me or from her parents. It was the other people that were giving her books that thought of other things that those babies might need. So she started this project. She had for three years. She was recognized by the state of Colorado as being one of the most empathetic, creative, entrepreneurial, nonprofit people that they had. She didn't have to go to school. She learned so much in those three years. So she now lives in Washington and it works for the State Department and she does things with kids overseas in schools. Um, her first year there and she's teaching compassion and mindfulness to kids all over the world. So as we're developing that potential, we have to really think about those experiences that are based upon their needs, similar to what we just talked about. Make it purposeful. They always ask why. You gotta anticipate that there's gonna be a why. There's gotta be a reason that we're doing this. Or we won't do it. Um, very challenging to find reasons for some things that they do, so that's a problem. Try to do your best to understand the emotional aspects of what they're doing and help them nurture that. And it's important to understand that we have to spend time on executive functioning. Mm -hmm. Not all of our gifted children are excellent at this. Um, and sometimes it's something that we pick our battles on. But it's okay, it's really okay for you to help your child up until they're in high school. Remind them, do you have your homework? Do you have pencils in your backpack or pens? Did you take your laundry down to the laundry room? It's okay to help them remember things. It's okay to develop checklists. When you start to say they have to take care of themselves, that's a little bit of a problem because they can't necessarily always do that. But remember that a little bit of help and support can go a long way. The other thing that's really important to keep in mind is that we know that Many of us are pretty fortunate because we're able to provide services for our gifted children. We don't know what to do, but you are here tonight, so you're doing something. 
But those families from underserved backgrounds don't have that opportunity, and we're not identifying those young people. So we're living in a community that has so many more young people than we're able to serve that have that potential. Something to remember as we're trying to advocate for our young people in schools. Because we know that unrecognized children, whether they're not recognized as gifted or seen as a person, when they go unseen, unheard, unfelt, they develop these challenging habits that are hard to break. In our evolution of being all now 20 years old, which is just remarkable, um, we understood that there was a problem in the country and we didn't know quite what to do with it. Everyone in the field gift has known that for a long time. And we go through cycles of services here and there and here and there. About four years ago, we brought together a group of people for a conference and we said, okay, this has got to stop. We've got to do something. We have to advocate for these kids. So we've got people to in from business, from technology, from you know, entrepreneurs, entertainment, just a whole bunch of people from different places and started to ask questions. Why do you think it is that we don't have gifted services for, for kids in our country? Well, the first question that somebody asked was, well, you think that gifted, you said all along that people don't think gifted education is important and they're not going to pay for it and they don't like gifted kids. How do you know that? I don't know. I had no idea. I had no idea why we think that. So the idea was you got to ask the American public what they think because you're assuming all these things and you're already in that negative space of they don't want it, so what do we do? So you're trying to, to fix something over here without even knowing what your information is. Everything against you've ever done, anything you ever say to a gifted kid, none of that is what you're doing here. So we decided to do the first poll on gifted education in the country. It's never been done. We hired two polling firms, one that was Obama's polling firm and one that was Bush's polling firm. So these are pretty respectful polling firms. They came together to make sure it was bipartisan. National poll. It's a big, long report. You can download it if you want on the website. We have a couple of short stints. But this is just something I think is interesting because as you're advocating for your children in all aspects of self, these are some of the things that came out of the poll. So when we ask the question of how important is it to you to fund training teachers to identify and serve gifted children? What would you think? Ninety yeah. percent of the American public thought that was an important thing. Well, shoot, we should be asking them more often what they think. Support funding to improve training teachers who are educating our children. 89%. Support requirements that any teacher who serves gifted children receive special training. 86%. Support allowing identified students to be accelerated. This is a big deal in our world. Acceleration. 87% thought that was okay. To represent and serve underserved populations. 86% that that was important. So when we're advocating for these kids and you go to your school district or you go to the school board or you go to anybody, we now know we have a little bit of momentum here, which is a good thing. And we have people that can support us. What we also discovered was that many people in the country didn't think a lot about gifted education because they thought we already did it. They assumed because we take care of kids on this spectrum, or in the middle, that we were taking care of the gifted children. They never thought it was a problem. No one ever asked. So now we're developing momentum of what we can do to help serve this population. And we were surprised. And happy. When was this said again? We finished third about a year and a half ago. So as we're taking all this information and this data together, how does this fit together? Some of the strategies. One, Understanding that the 
physical and emotional well-being of our children is really important. Talking about those things is critical. And doing that through nature and through positive associations with nature is, is amazing. There's so much research now to understand it. Even being in nature can calm a body, but it can replace therapy sometimes. So we often have our kids go outside and sit on a lawn and look up at the sky. Or hug a tree. Sounds silly. It's amazing. Take your shoes off, walk in the grass. All those things that we used to do sometimes as kids or have access to that nature is really, really important. If I have a kid who's struggling in the morning to go to school because they don't want to go because it's boring, get up, run around out in the backyard, go sit by the tree for a minute, calms down. That physical exposure to green space and playing with friends in that space really provides amazing, unique experiences that help create those relationships and that bonding. I like Calvin. Can you tell? So again, how do we see things a little bit differently? What kind of glasses are we looking at today to figure out who these kids are and what we need to do next? Reframing what we see and what we do, building that resilience. We have to encourage them to step outside their comfort zone. That doesn't mean necessarily only in school. Things translate over. If you're climbing a, a rope or building a big tall ladder or something, everything that you do that takes a risk that you're not sure you can actually accomplish, having that aha experience transfers into building that intellect and feeding all aspects of who you are. Really working with that sense of humor to help manage things, to, to laugh off some of those things that are so challenging and difficult. Work with intensities. Make sure you have some kind of emotional awareness, using some words that work together. Help working through things and have that ability to keep going back again. That perseverance is really important. Looking at things from a positive perspective, put those glasses on. Let's look at it a little bit different way. How can we see this? How does that other child think today that you thought was really upset with you? How, how can you picture what their life is like? And learning from mistakes. I think you have the strategies in your, in your handout, but just to highlight a few, really talking about what brings you joy. We don't really talk about that a lot as a community or a culture, but those are really important things for a child to remember to help them with their passion. What is it that brings you joy? That's something that you can do with your child. What brings you joy? How do you replicate that so that you're modeling that behavior? The things that just make you happy and content. This quiet reflection time is really important. Sometimes being quiet is awesome for everybody. Figuring that out is really great. Some of these kids don't really like competitive sports, competition at all. So figuring out ways to be physically active without having that competitiveness is really a big thing. And really working with that mind-body connection. We do visualizations and yoga with our kids. And it really makes a difference when you help them try to visualize things, usually it's with nature, to get started with, to calm the body and mind. And once these kids figure that out, three smart guys, then they can start to regulate themselves through guided visualization. And it's really amazing to see what they can do in that regard. The other thing that's important is for you to understand. Can we go back to the sure. Now, we know some kids, they are not physically direct well. So I agree with most of the kids in the sport. But the last part of the challenge in all areas, how do we balance this challenge of his physical ability? So there's just different ways of being physical. So it may not be in playing basketball or playing soccer, but maybe it's in running or playing tennis or golf or biking. Something that's, that they're competing against themselves, so they're learning how to do something on their own, but they're not afraid of letting their team down or other people down, that kind of thing. 
So it's a, anything to keep physically active, that's what we're referring to here. I think the individual is okay, you go to run by yourself, swim, hiking by yourself, but in school, you have to be like a, a team like uh, you you have to be join the team. You so so that's where you go into the things of this is this is what we're doing today and talking about resilience of what's the worst thing that can happen to help them get through that moment. That may not be their physical choice for life. Their life choices are probably gonna be more individualized, but to get through those team things that they kind of have to do in PE of what's the worst that could happen? Your team loses. Did you help make the basket? So trying to help them either laugh off or figure out other ways to look at that situation. There are many, many places that we actually have kids that we create spaces for them. So during recess or lunch or after school when kids are playing some of those teams, they just gather that way. There are other activities that they can do that are not necessarily as physical, whether it's cornrow or other different kinds of activities that aren't team sports. But I, that's a very good question because a lot of these kids are required to do those things in, in their daily life at school. But if they choose to do other activities that no one's joining him and he's alone, then that's another issue, right? Well, it, it depends on, is it, does it bother him? Yeah. If it bothers him, that is, so it's trying to find another intellectual peer, because I'm sure he's doing something that's not of interest to other kids, probably. So trying to find somebody else at the school site, maybe older, or um, is there a, an aide or a teacher that would sit with him during those times to do those activities because again it's the cross age is fine some of these kids best friends could be three years older than they are or, or an adult but making sure they're learning how to develop those relationships is important i mean age peers sometimes is really hard going to the library will they let you do that yeah that's another working with the school to find a safe place he could be where he doesn't feel like he's seen as being alone. Because sometimes that perception yeah. of what other people are looking at him being alone is part of the problem. There's, am I right that with that difficulty that a lot of the, the let me slow down, a lot of the gifted kids do have that difficulty sometimes. Um, am I correct that Looking into the idea of a play companion, an adult play companion that you bring into the school could be a possibility for that. I mean, it depends on the school site. The more flexible they are with you, great. But often it's finding somebody even at the school that can, can be that if the school becomes allows that to happen. So yeah, finding those kind of peer groups. Um, we talked a little bit about, about finding the common vocabulary. This is kind of important, and this kind of goes to what you're saying. Of sometimes families, I know, they create their own words, so they, they know of what that means. So if they want out of a situation that's challenging or, or not working well for them, there, there's, a, there's a word that they can use that you know means they need help. Make sure you're keeping all of your emotions in check as well as theirs. The best thing that, that I think we have ever done for our kids is to help them take their own time out when they need to, to do that. And for you to take your own time out and don't remove the kid. Sometimes you just have to walk away and think about it. And you're modeling again, that behavior. I don't know if time-wise if we have time for this, but let's just finish here and then let's go with some questions. Any questions? So I know you have been uh, as an educator, teacher for a long time. One question for you is, uh, does school like this kind of kids, current gift kids? It when depends. It can be challenging. When you apply to school, do you mention that your kid is a current and kid? And, but if they know, then hope they will think about this is an emotional kid or something. I think for the most part, any communication you have that's done in, in the kindest possible way with the teacher is good communication. I don't think teachers wake up in the morning trying to think they're going to make 
life miserable for a kid today. But sometimes they just don't know. And until they really see things differently and helping them see my child does well with this kind of support or my child needs a little more engagement here, that's the kind of thing that really will be helpful to them. Um, I think some schools are challenged by get to kids because they don't know what to do. And there's still a perception that acceleration is not a positive thing, even though there's tons of evidence to demonstrate that there is. But we also know from the poll that most people think it's probably an okay idea until you get down to your school and your teacher doing it, but then it's giving them the vocabulary and the help that they need to do that. I think that there's, there are many parents that say, should I tell the school my child's been tested and is gifted? Yes. Yes. <coughs> that communication is really important. Yes. So you talked about, I think that um, survey that was done talked about educating teachers. And that's been our biggest challenge, at least until we had to pull our son out of school, but for other reasons. Um, I have not yet come across a teacher that truly understood when it meant for a child to be gifted, but that a gifted child could also have, I'll call it learning disabilities, for lack of a better term, but like processing disorders and, and whatnot, which I'm finding, I'm, I'm all, I'm, I'm very new to all this, but I'm learning a lot really fast. Um, they coexist, this high intellect and these, these challenges, and I haven't found a teacher yet that understands that you can have a kid like that, and that maybe there are certain accommodations that need to be made instead of punishing the child. How, how do you get that across? And based on the survey that you had, that said people want to see this stuff funded and done, how long do you think that's going to take? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the next step of how we do the marketing and make this happen. But, but I really do believe that most teachers want to do the right thing, but they just don't know what that is. It doesn't seem to be. I mean, so, I always thought that when teachers went through school and they were earning their degree, that maybe there was a class on this, just like there's. Yeah. I'm assuming a class on special ed right. or no. whatever. It doesn't, I'm learning that that isn't exactly the case. Correct. Teachers are, there's never a, a class on gifted, what that means. So it, it is really unfortunately on the parents normally to have to bring materials in or talk about what that looks like, come with strategies. It's important to talk to your child about strategies to help them get through. When it's in its worst case scenario, giving them things like if you're doing math worksheets that they know everything to, I have them turn the paper upside down. And that's, a, that's an aha moment. That's taking, they're thinking you're bring a different way and they have to just have them use their left hand as their right hand or right hand as the left hand. So little things to help them get through that so they get it done. And if they still get the right answer, woohoo, that's great. But those kinds of things are, are good for your child. Giving your child language to be able to say to the teacher, can I demonstrate to you that I already know this? And then can we do something different? It's hard. And it's challenging because you don't want to be that parent either. But, <laughs> but, you, kind, but you kind of have to be because you're, it's what I found was that when I would try to educate the teacher, and I wouldn't go in there like, you know, raging bull. I would go in with maybe articles, or I even bought one teacher a book and said, hey, I'm finding this book, <coughs> would you be interested in reading it? And she said, yes, so I bought it for her. I don't think she ever opened it. <laughs> I really don't think they were interested in understanding what they were dealing with. They had already identified him as this is what he is. It was completely inaccurate, but I don't know, maybe my approach was wrong. How would you approach that when you go in and talk to a teacher to just say, you know, here's what my kid needs. These are his challenges, but you also have to understand that just because he has these challenges doesn't mean that this other part of him doesn't exist. Meaning the intellectual side that needs to be fed, but hey, my kid can't take notes from a board because he has these issues. 
Okay. Well, the twice exceptional piece is very challenging because the majority of teachers see that exception. They see the problem in the child, and they are only thinking about that as I need to remediate the problem or work with that. And they don't see, they find it challenging to, to believe that a child could have these issues but still be at a capacity two grade levels above their, their peers. And again, all the research demonstrates if you work with the child where they are in that two years above whatever that intellectual space is, the other piece kind of picks up and, and improves enough to be able to really work on both and get that balance a little bit better. But it is hard for, do you, do you have a thought? I also have a choice, exceptional child seven. Um, I think we're lucky that our school allows, he's really advanced in reading, let's say, like several grade levels above. And they let him read at his own level, so that's nice. But then he's behind, no, sorry, he's not behind, he's on grade level for, let's say, spelling. To me, that's behind, and to him, more importantly, not to me like I want him to do well, but just relatively, mm -hmm. I can see, and it just doesn't make sense, like you have this great memory, you have your reading, but you can't spell. Like, I don't get it. And then, so I've always just talked to the teachers, and but they are like, he's on a grade level. That, but yeah. I'm like, but he's not meeting his potential. That's because okay. the, yeah, kind of that, going back to the scoring, the bell curve, like he's, the twice exceptional, the attention stuff is down here, let's say, but the cogn cognitive level is so high that the spelling should probably not be on a grade level. It's, but they're not. But there are other issues. But there, could, there could be some dyslexia, processing disorder, um, it's just not something they value. Ooh, I mean, you just but it's also to, like not willing yeah. to for, to go faster, like or to give sort of special because his, his processing is really high too. So it's it's not making it's not totally making sense. But it's he's getting a negative self concept about it, right? So it's it's hard to like get them to advance him in all areas, I guess, or to advance it. Well, so what you're saying is that he's he's kind of doing what he just what he's supposed to be doing, right? Which for a teacher is like, well, this is great. What's yeah. the problem? Totally. <laughs> so he's doing his words. He knows the spelling. He's got. There's not an issue here for me. Um, so that that is where you're going to have the challenge. Mm -hmm. Demonstrating that your child is able to or performing at a grade level one or two above is is hard but that is kind of what you need to do is to be able to say at home this is what happens or can we can i circle three or four pro problems on this math worksheet so you can see what he's doing what we do know is that when a child is fed intellectually at their level and challenged at least three hours a week it starts to really calm them down. Then you can, can build you on that. Down the other behavioral issues? Yes. <laughs> and then they start then they can start to see it helps their self-confidence and they can start to see things in a little clearer way. So at least three hours away of that we a very challenging thing. That's a supplemental kind of thing. 72 hours of that kind of intense work in a short period of time of, of a week or two is really three weeks is really even better. So if you can get your school to say, all right, for one period a day, half an hour, he's gonna read an advanced level, or do the, this advanced math, or spend some time after school doing a project. It's not ideal at all. You'd rather have a child in a cluster group where they're with other peers doing that 24 hours a day. But as soon as you can start to get that to happen, then, teachers start to see, usually. It doesn't always happen. It doesn't always happen. And it really depends in that situation too on what they're allowed to do. Mm -hmm. Many teachers are told you have to go step by step in this mm -hmm. curriculum and you have to do it this way because this is the way you have to do it. And there's still a perception that if they skip over it, 
there'll be a hole in their learning. <laughs> it's not true. These kids sometimes know stuff, and they may know stuff that's very advanced. They're going to fill in that hole on their own or be able to identify what it is and ask for help as soon as they have that or calm enough to agree with that is. I was just going to say, I mean, I think you've probably had this experience already because your child was removed from the school. No, we removed him because we discovered learning disabilities right. and needed to get the therapy for him, and there just wasn't enough time to do that and have him enrolled school, in school full time. My, my mom, was, I raised three kids, countless other teachers, and I often had to find someone else in the school besides the teacher to be an advocate for my kid. And it wasn't always the principal, but sometimes it was. But as I got older, it was the psychologist in the high school or the trade level counselor, the academic counselor, but somebody who you can get to buy in if this is going on, and then they work with the teacher because it, sometimes it holds more authority than me. Yes, I know we haven't had any of that in no. the high school. Oh, um, so. It's you and the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and sometimes it's trying to see if you can't say, can you just try, at least in second grade, can you just try third grade reading just for a little while? Can we just see how, how it fits? Sure. But those are telling us something too. So we were talking about having three hours a week of intense work to challenge them. And then convincing the child that it's okay to go back down to this boring. Oh, no, no, you're not convincing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what you're, you're saying, you're saying is that we're going to do our best and we're going to make sure you have those aha moments because we're going to keep stretching that brain and we're going to make sure that works for you. And, and you <clears throat> hope that you are stretching that. And not that it isn't easy because yeah, you want to make sure you have that risk we're taking. Stuck right now with uh, well, if if he only does what I just gave him that everybody else is doing, then he can move on to the next challenging thing, and he won't do it because he has That's right. meaningful work. It's not purposeful, right? There's no reason to do it, right? It doesn't make sense. So that's where you have, you need to be the advocate to demonstrate or teach him to demonstrate whatever you're saying if he's doing. Triple digit something, and they're doing single digit for a silly example. Demo show that they, he can do that, and then try to convince them to say, Okay, if he could just demonstrate by doing five problems of whatever you're teaching right now that he can do that, can he move on instead of doing a whole worksheet? Can you do the end of chapter test to demonstrate this? We've had a pre test 100%, we're still stuck. So that's the thing, the you don't want to hundred percent. Right, and it's consistently. You, you want them to say, you want them to keep giving that, that end of chapter test till he gets 70%. This is before they've even taught the material that he's demonstrating here. Mm -hmm. so, right, yeah. so you just keep going until he demonstrates that there's a struggle. And that's where you say, this is where we start. Because if he's getting hundred percent, you have no idea. Right. Yeah. yeah. So but then we have the, the other challenge of the math curriculum involves so much writing. Yeah. You know, explain not necessarily how you solve the problem, but explain the way we want you to explain how to solve the problem. And he hates it. I mean, he knows how to do it now, but he hates it. And this child loves math. And now he's learning to not like math because of what it being forced to do. How do I advocate on that when they're telling me, no, he... He's demonstrating some of it, but he has to do the whole thing in order for us to advance into the next level. It, it's the biggest struggle, but it really, it, it really it is. But it really is demonstrating okay. that he can do it at a higher level. And even if you, with some places, even if you bring work in, they're going to say, I want to see him do it right here. It, that's unfortunate. Um, some places are getting better at that, but because they're, we're so test focused, they want to make sure that the kids can fill up things exactly the way they need to prove it for an evaluation. It is one of the most difficult and challenging things for kids to understand. Sometimes you look at the paperwork that the kids come home with and the way that they are expected to mm -hmm. solve a problem. You think, why are they doing that? Right. It's just so. It's not, it's the, way so it's not the way my kids' brain works. 
you know, I wonder, um, I'm sure you have, but have you been escalating this past the teacher, you know? The teacher supervisor, the next supervisor, <clears throat> love that. Because we just talked with the teacher and the principal again. Maybe you need to go above the principal. Yeah. I mean, quite honestly, um, if the principal's not intelligent enough to understand what he's looking at, hopefully his boss will again reach out. Again, yeah. we know we can solve the, the numbers, but he has to do this writing thing for the curriculum. I don't know. Well, well, like if you can, if you can get to the person above, 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 who finally understands what you're talking about, and then you can say to your kid, who's clearly intelligent, look. I want you in front of this specific person. This specific person is going to care about what you're, what right. you can do. Therefore, if you can this one time, right. you know, go through those steps in front of this specific person and convince him, then you're free or whatever. BS your kid or you can tell your kid. But that's really what we're talking about. Um, and you're clearly, you know, intelligent. I'm not gifted. You're not gifted, but our kids are. But. You're clearly intelligent, so you can say, forget you, you don't know what you're talking about, I'm going over your head. I have heard of people get accommodations, right? You can ask like for kids not to do that part of it. Um, I've also had a friend of mine just told their kid, don't, I don't, I don't care if you fail that part, mm. because I know you get it. And I, let's just not care about that. That's mm. smart. And that's too hard. That's that's right. right. That's like in this setting. Uh, yes, it depends, but I kind of like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. You need to do two or three problems to demonstrate that you know it and be polite <laughs> like, respectful. Do you have do you have an assessment? Not yet for this one. We do for the older one. Sometimes that helps immensely walking in. Mm -hmm. It's kind of I hard to Yeah, you walk in and you say, Look, my kids at this level, right? Help me out here. You gotta you gotta give me something. <laughs> Yeah, something. Um, my my kid's in uh, five years old. He's finishing up preschool right now. I'm at the very beginning of this whole thing. Okay, but from everything, I, I'm I'm you know going in circles trying to figure out what's going on online. I'm so happy I found this group. I'm like, okay, this is the tip of the iceberg. All these different things. Um, it might be a negative way of looking at it, but part of me is saying, look, I'm not, uh, what I'm looking at realistically is basically what I'm trying to. Continue to challenge my kid and literally just try to get him through school until he gets to college where then, you know, it won't matter what grade he's in or if he gets into the real world where it won't matter what grade he's in kind of thing. Is that sort of, I mean, I know it's not, negative, but not, necessarily, sort of it's not necessarily, but there are going to be years where it is getting through because not every school, very few. Like wait it out. That's what I'm saying when I say yeah. Well, it's you're having to supplement. You're having to fill in those gaps and you're having to provide those opportunities. Again, the best thing to do, if you can do it and you have the, the assessment tools to, to demonstrate this, to do any kind of acceleration, that's gonna be the best saving grace you have. So, I know that you talked at the beginning about IEA having consulting services, and that sometimes you go and you work with the school. What kinds of services does IEA have, and when would it be appropriate to have someone from here, whether it's you or someone else, come to a school? Like, what would that look like? Or do you need to be invited, or do you invite yourself? So, well, invited. That's, that's an important question. Um, unless it is part of this 501 plan. So you can request a special plan for your child. It does mean you want an educational plan, basically. And, and that's what and that's what they'll do for um, a gifted child because you don't necessarily need the IEP. You might need the IEP if you have a child who is twice exceptional. And that would need to include not only accommodations for the unique needs of scrapia or whatever happens to be, but you also can add in, in a um, IEP things for gifted. At those meetings, you're allowed to invite an advocate. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of doing it. If you don't want to go that route, and sometimes you don't need to go all the way through that, it's, it's simply saying, look, we're working with a specialist with my child. Would you be willing to talk to them about some ideas that they have? Would, you, would that be something you'd be willing to do? So there has to be a communication there. And, and then I would say about 50% of the time, 
there's enough conversation that something is, a, there's an accommodation made um, because it's coming from somebody not quite the parent. Mm -hmm. So the IEP would be for anything you're struggling with, the 504 would be for accommodations or giftedness, like say, like she was talking about letting them read ahead or do a different thing. If you have an IEP, you don't need both. I see. Mm -hmm. But so you have to have a 504 for um, slow processing. Um, so she got extra time for tests okay. right through the SAT and in college. So those resources are there throughout. But, you know, we didn't, she wasn't behind enough from school for them to test her. Yeah. So we didn't See, that's, that's my other question. I was, just, I was just told this week, well, he's clearly, here's our data showing that he's, He's at or well above grade level, so he does not qualify for IEP. That's where he's really struggling. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not true. So, so that's, that's what I schools were. I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so there's a perception, and that goes back to it depends on what you can do. It's much easier but to not like go the IEP route. There may be a 2E going on, and so in order to even get that assessment, I'm getting an argument. For 2E, you have to demonstrate that the child is struggling two grade levels below where he needs to be. You can also have a behavior. And that's what's going on. on. There's, there's some behavior. But then it, it has to be significant it's enough, it's enough right. Right. to, to warrant that. Just, to not to just disrupt behavior. their own education, but to disrupt the classroom. Yeah, right. So that's why this other plan is a little bit easier to get and schools are a little bit more willing to do that because they don't have to have quite the same amount of people on the team. Yes. Or we can bring medical diagnosis to the table and yes. they're willing to work yes. Then we have to go on our own to do yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes you can get your insurance to pay for it. Just because mm -hmm. you have to go on your own doesn't necessarily mean we'll have to pay for it yeah. yourself. Look at the back of your insurance card, see if there's a... Uh, um, I forget their, their, the way they say it, but it's basically, do you need psychological services? This, talk to your doctor if you see that, and say, yeah, I think he, your son or daughter would benefit from an assessment. Then take that, and like on ours, we would just, we just went straight to the doctor, and then they, with the know from the doctor, and then they were able to code it and send it off, and mm -hmm. that was very helpful. But right. well, you didn't even the diagnosis stay with the child or something like that? The diagnosis of her gifting? It's no, more right. that's, that's not a diagnosis. Yeah, it's a it's a it would be in their yeah. record. Our daughter did, was not run under diagnosis. She didn't qualify for a mental health diagnosis, although she had a so your school was unique in providing you that. Well, it was. Well, she, she, yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> so I was pretty insistent about it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what. Those those are are saying, you but, have to really but I also yeah. think when that means that some other time in that school's history, they have done it's it and it's been too. successful. Well, it's been successful because normally what happens when you go to a school and you work with them on one or two kids for school, then they get it mm -hmm. because or a teacher who's trained that by doing if I give this child a little more challenging math during the day the kids a happy kid yes. and then right. I don't have a problem anymore right so once they learn that you don't unlearn that behavior so what that says to me is somebody did this before you did you probably pushed them into it but they had it success at one point in time. Mm -hmm. So those schools that have been through that, typically, unfortunately, many of you have to be the trailblazer in your school. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. typically, once they get that, that wow, this isn't that hard to do. And look how happy this kid is now. <gasps> okay, I was going to say that when your, your child's done, it's a little hard. But my son is about older. I found him to be the most effective advocate much more so than I can be. So like he can't handwrite to save his life. And he was in his English class and they had to handwrite their essays and he couldn't get out his words. And his, he went to his teacher and he discussed like, I can write essay, you know this because I can type, but I can't handwrite it for the AP English. I'm not able to, I don't know what to do. And she was able to help. Him. And much more powerful than me going in. Oh, but that, he's 17, so yeah. I you know he's little, it's, it's different. Yeah. 
harder as they get older. But again, giving them that, building up that resilience and self-confidence using the right words, the best thing they do is advocate for themselves as early as they can in a polite way versus getting into that behavior problem where I don't want to do this and it's boring and it's just ripping up papers and things. Um, the idea of, you know, the minimum of three hours of giving them the challenge that they crave, you know? Um, I can't find any of those extracurricular type of things after school or even before school for a kid so young. How, where do you go to find those? What do you do? Here. Here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's a place to start. I know uh, like Jonathan, they have been following the uh, talent kids for years and mm -hmm. years and see how they're doing. Just a uh, 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 curious question. If the kids, like say, it's time for, you say, writing, math, if you don't continue to stimulate training, do they lose that part of the time when they're question. growing up? Um, no, not necessarily. But it, they do better if they are continuing to nurture in that in those ways. There are kids that get tired of doing things, mm -hmm. and they may walk away from one. They may have loved math for ten years of their life, and they decide they don't want to do it in college because they are kind of tired of it. Mm -hmm. But they'll come back to a career that has it. So there's an interest level as well that they may be very good at something, but just may not like it anymore. Um, but for the most part, you can't, if there's something continued to go in, the child's going to be okay. I, I, I'll, I'll make sure you're encouraged by that. If there's nothing done for a child, then there's, then there's a good chance that the child will not work towards their potential or meet their potential. I don't think anybody can meet their potential, but no, can't, wouldn't work towards that. So it's, it's those trials that are left to stagnate with nothing that you worry about. Um, but all of your kids, because when you're here and they're in situations where there, something is happening, I don't want you to be discouraged that, that because they're not getting the best every minute of the day that something's going to be wrong. That's not true. Why I'm saying this one? Because uh, some scientists and psychologists, they don't agree with the talent. They don't agree with the IQ test. They said, we say this person is a talent or gift, not when they are young, but when they achieve some success. Then, then they look back and see this is the gift, biggest talent. Well, there, there's, a, there's a big debate in the field of gifted education right now, and that is talent development versus gifted development. And that a child has to d demonstrate their talent or, or their achievement or do something that is remarkable to be able to be classified as somebody who has exceptional talent. Um, like in music or something. Music, math, science, wh whatever it happens to be. Um, certainly that's what we all want our kids to do is to be successful in what they're doing, find that passion, and then move, move that forward for themselves and for the field. I mean, yeah, that'd be great. But not every child is going to do that. If you... Still, if you have an IQ of 140, you're gifted. Mm -hmm. And whether or not you end up being a rocket scientist or not, I think that that's where you are. It's that talent development that I think you're talking about. Of, do we have to be on this child all the time to make sure they get to that level? It doesn't necessarily have to be that way as long as they're given the opportunity to explore it. You want to make sure you're opening those doors and keeping things available um, and not pushing too hard because you don't want to snap that, but you want to keep that gentle tension. Um, and sometimes they might want to back away and give them that option to back away a little bit is probably a good thing to reflect and then decide this, where they want to go next. That happens with these kids too. They have so many interests and so many things they want to do that they can't physically and emotionally continue at an immense level in all those things. So reflecting and pausing for a minute to take a 
moment. Where is your passion? And let, let, then we'll help you get to what that is. My, my son goes to a dual language immersion program, and um, they were short on teachers, and, and my wife speaks the language that he's learning at school. So she went in to substitute teach, and she gave up. She said it's like being in the belly of a beast because she had, I'm just thinking about your, your child, but she, she found children in the third and fourth grade that should have had a proficiency in language and have been moved up a grade, but apparently having that ability, but clearly didn't happen in some cases about two grades below. But they, she said, I mean, her, she wasn't really sure what the reason was, but part of it she thought was that there's just a push, you, you've got to move everybody up, you, you have more people coming in at the other end of the pipeline and you've got to push them through and get them out. And she was horrified to the extent that she gave it up. Wow. <laughs> she couldn't do it anymore. But it, it, was, it was a real eye for us. And it just, all it did with us was that, I mean, we, we kind of had reservations anyway, but it just clarified for us that we just need to make sure that we do as much as we can outside of school for him so that he gets the opportunities that we think he's capable of utilizing. Well, and that's one of the things that most of the, when kids actually articulate and they don't just stop saying they're bored, but they articulate what one of the issues is, is they don't like it that the other kids, one, can't keep up, or two, mm -hmm. are that they just take so much time, teacher time, and they don't get any time because they want to learn something and these kids don't know it. And that's yeah. it's hard, again, going back to justice, it's hard for them to understand why am I stuck here? But she, she's found that there was, there came a point in some classes where she was just like, okay, you're clearly, and I mean, this is in terms of behavior as well. Oh, yeah. You're clearly not, you're not in this class. You're not prepared to work with this class. I'm going to have to work with people that I can work with. And that's what she did. But she didn't want to keep doing that. So she enjoyed it. That's true. Well, and that goes back to the teachers have so much they have to deal with. Well, no, that's, and that's also part of the problem is that, is that they can only put so much of their time and attention to those. Yeah. Um, one thing that I would love to get help from everyone is um, I've been trying to supplement, but there are only so many hours in the day. If, if, you, if you're not pulling the kid out of school, right? because it's important for them to also get the social aspect or whatever, you're trying to let them be a kid still or something. Um, how do you add in all of the uh, challenging pieces outside of school because they're not doing it in school? I, I don't even know. You lose your life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying I lose my life. I'm talking about even for the day there are so many hours in the day. Uh, my, son, my son said to me the other weekend, he said, I'm so glad it's Sunday because yesterday he was so busy and he had Cello class, he had baseball, he had karate, yeah. and he had music therapy and um, therapy, um, theory. But, <laughs> but those are all things that he's just good. You know what I mean? We don't, we don't force any of it. In fact, we told him he can stop cello, but he wants to do it, so we mm -hmm. we carry on doing it. But it, it does mean you don't have a weekend. Yeah. Actually, my question is relevant to what she's asking. Like, what will be the tactical strategy for the kids to get by the day if it's really boring, but he hardly has to be there? And for the moment, my kids is like he find he either find he, himself a friend who is also idling or bored, and to chat, which is not good, or he will just he, if he cannot find anybody, he will just find a pen and take a part to the routine. <laughs> 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 I've got some things he can yeah. fix. <laughs> <laughs> Just daydreaming. So, what, but I do feel like it's a kind of not waste of time and not proper use of time and their energy and uh, brilliancy of what they have. Well, and and that, that's really very, very challenging. And if the school's not going to provide you with any kind of accommodation during those times, I often say, and I, and I apologize to teachers all over the world, that it's probably my fault that these kids are turning the papers upside down or using the other hand or um, intentionally saying, this is a, again, I'm going to use a simple analogy, uh, addition worksheet, writing on top, I'm going to do this, I'm going to multiply this today, and then do it that way. So intentionally doing things that they haven't been asked to do to keep their mind going. I also say, what's your favorite song? Keep it in your head, sing that song, do your visualizations, calm yourself down, find other things you can do. I think the pen thing's a great thing. <laughs> 
I think yeah. it's awesome. Yeah. And yeah. Like, you guys keep buying that, you know? Yeah. It's going to be a challenge. You know, it's going to be a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Like, 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 seriously, what you're saying about the pen, you know, you could, um, every week, okay, give him a different small mechanical thing that he can take to school with him that can be hidden all day. And then when he's super bored, he's at the desk. He's going and he's taking a new thing. And you need to inform the teacher that this is going on. I was going to say, he's hiding. Yeah. 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 As long as it's not, the biggest thing to do, if you can do it, is anything that's not going to disrupt the other kids. Yeah, so that's he, right. the pen probably doesn't, but yeah. a small thing that he can do and take apart and put together again. Anything like that is great. They have the widgets. But the kids that do the Rubik's Cube, those are great too. Um, it's not the best stimulation, yeah, it's but it's it's something. The other thing is, make can he be reading at his desk? Right. Is there something he can is be he reading? Really cannot. I think he has. The, he's he's the other chatty friend trying to read it. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So they're in this together. Yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, they're already separated across the same <laughs> room, but they still have some eye contact. <laughs> 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 so they have to create a language yeah. and ask them to create a language and see if we can use together. They use their mind. <laughs> so our code. So anything they can do to help do something with their with their creativity, that's in not a destructive way. Well, and I've challenged my kid. That they won't hear what's going on. That is true. They they hear while we're talking. Yeah. Yeah. And but I was going to say I challenge my kid when he's bored in math. I say, okay, then you come up with a more challenging problem, and then you work it out. Yeah. And then maybe you can teach it. And you come up with a more challenging problem, and then you work it out, and then maybe you can teach it. You know, I don't know, to the teacher or to your brother or whatever, mm -hmm. and or find new patterns that you know while everyone else is working are good on thing. it. Yeah, come up with new patterns are a good thing, and that seems to help my kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, write your own equation. Make it make it harder. Get, make it so hard that you can't solve it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's where you're, it's it good. works. That's a good thing. Yeah, that's a very good thing. Any other questions? Oh, our son Andrew has been here for, but the the teacher here will be kind of a tray or what a mind about the big kids, how to train them or how are they trained? Yeah. All of the let me go back. We philosophically believe that the instructors need to be content area specialists. So they're individuals that do this because they're passionate about it. So if we do that first. Not every one of those people are trained teachers, but they love what they do. So then we help them understand this is a young child who has a similar passion for biology, for example. Let's work together to create a curriculum. Let's, let's work together to see how you can engage students in biology. And that's where they get really excited again, because that person who's passionate about biology likes to share. So that's how they, so they're, they're not trained in formal training with gifted. We go with the content and then help them learn how to work with kids. That makes and before every session, there is a teacher training. Uh, for all of the instructors who will be starting the academy. So they do receive that background of care, the types of kids you'll be working with, and so you'll get your curriculum to make sure that it matches that and filling that need. And there's ongoing support from the team if, if, if that is necessary too. And the classes are still, so it makes it a little bit, in, there's a little bit of individualization going on there too. And are they an okay match for twice exceptional kids? or do you We have really yeah. <laughs> we have quite a few kids at home because, again, this is something they're doing because their passion, they want to, and they want to learn and explore. If they have to do it with a typewriter instead of typewriter, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. We all get it too. Yeah. I didn't even notice it. She would probably take it away. My kid, my kid would bring a typewriter. That would be we should do. We should just have typewriters and get the kids back in it. My son just did his first class. It's not the same type of class that they would have in a classroom where there's homework and, and whatnot. There might be 
something you need to take home or have to do at home. But there's no grades. It's purely for their intellectual curiosity and just to fill that void of what they're not getting somewhere else. Yeah. And when you have a teacher who's just as passionate as they are, and they ask some off the wall question, the teacher is excited. Hey, wait, I didn't know, don't know about this. Or hey, yeah, I do. Tangents are okay. We, yeah, tangents are okay. Mm -hmm. and and so because there's time. They get excited. I never heard one complaint. It was the most amazing class ever. Oh. <laughs> it's really nice when you see kids leave so happy. It is like yeah. Nice. I was told, uh, we, uh, my kids hadn't uh, attended class yet, but I uh, told me, give it a try for the uh, one of the class, and uh, because you're allowed to talk. And she <laughs> 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 tell me, bring us back. Nice. Yeah, but, uh, then he has, yeah, actually, that's the, uh, one of the questions. He said, like, is there anything hands on? Because the one of class I'm thinking about is plastic. I, I think it's such a good idea to have uh, the, for the summer academy. The, 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 the printer? printer? The plastic. Mm -hmm. No, it's like the problem of plastic. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, and how so yeah, yeah. And is it just a mind? He, he, he was asking me if, if there is anything hands on or it's just an idea. All of the classes have a variety of things that they do. So mm -hmm. there, there's no one format of just a lecture aspect of what they do. There is always an activity of some kind because these kids like to move, so it's in their best interest to find ways to keep them moving and doing things. But it's not hard to fix because the, the, the reason I'm asking is because I happened to went to the science fair, uh, the California science fair, and there are actually projects they're doing just to deal with the plastics in the ocean or those things. They actually created things, so it's like. I couldn't tell you exactly what the bottom line for this class is, but, but I can tell you that the majority of classes do have projects that they do. You can see the, what the kids are creating all over the, the space, so there's lots of that going on. I can't tell you, I don't know if you know the exact, if there's a project in that particular class. Uh, some classes do have sort of like an end of class yeah, project. Yeah, I just don't know about this one. Other projects just as each class will yeah. come I believe there's some upstairs, so I'd be happy to... Well, you know, there's, 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 I don't think there is project space uh, related to that. No, not that class yeah. yet. Yeah. yeah. But there are other projects right. available for you right. to see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I went past it. Thank you. Oh. Um, going back to the like the 2E and the gifted um, oversight abilities, um, how would you get accommodations if you don't have a medical diagnosis for, say, an, you know, emotional you know, meltdowns at school and things like that? So in that situation, you're going back to behavior because that's what they're after. Yes, behavior. Yeah, and understand the behavioral that. plan. And and then it's helping them say, this is what works for my child. Okay. So when this behavior starts, you've got to catch it early. Helping your child right. learn how to catch it early. Of, he needs to get up and walk to the wa water fountain, drink fountain, or or be able to go to the bathroom, or be able to sit down and read for a minute, or go off to a quiet corner and breathe, or whatever it is We're that works. With the teacher on that. Sometimes, sometimes, it'll, it, they'll, sometimes you'll start with the teacher, right? right? But if it doesn't feel like it's working, you'll kind of push it up. If it's a 504, yeah, 504 then it's going to include more staff. Structure. Right, at that point, you need a medical diagnosis. Oh, not for that. I don't think we, you need we, it's, it's not required to diagnose. Not for that. You have more power if you got it's more power. Yeah. One thing with regard to the diagnosis, um, again, I, I, this is my first, I, I don't know anything about this stuff with this kid. I kept going to places almost to get them to do a diagnosis, even though I don't think there's anything wrong with them. Do you know what I mean? Because getting a diagnosis then opens it up to, okay, now you're going to accommodate and help. You know, um, Lantern and Regional Center, I don't know if you've gone there or not, they are the ones that finally, after the amount of money I spent and the amount of time, the things that I put him through, um, finally helped. Yeah. 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 I think the racial center is usually for zero to five. Like you have to start it for zero to five. Just, just out of oh, beyond. Check in. Yeah, way beyond. <laughs> it's it's like a, I don't have any experience with public schools, at least not yet. Do they offer occupational therapy in the school? I've been, I've been told occupational therapy is only for when you're younger, and when you get older, they kind of now. I don't know how old. My pediatrician told me this. My okay. son's eight years old. I need a new doctor. My son still doesn't work. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Yeah.